Uh, we're in our seventh lesson in the book of Nehemiah. Some of you may feel like it's your 70th, but hopefully not. Uh, we're about to wrap this series up, and in a few weeks, we'll begin a series on the book of Ephesians, and I'm very excited about being in that series with you. We'll have more to say about that uh, over the next couple of Sundays. But uh, lesson seven today uh, in an eight-week series on the book of Nehemiah. Last week, we examined themes in Nehemiah that showcase the importance of making a plan and working the plan. And we've used that terminology a lot. During this interim season, we invite you to just keep working the plan until the Lord reveals a new planning partner in your next preaching minister. And this is not going to be someone who's going to come here and work the plan by himself, right? We're all in this together. We're the body of Christ, not one part of the body of Christ doing all the work. Um, But this is an individual who's going to faithfully partner with your elders and partner with you uh, to live into that which God will reveal over the next uh, several months. So the plan is designed to, to set really clear expectations about what we do as a church and more importantly, why we do what we do. And those are some of the conversations that we're having uh, right now. I came across a phrase, some of you may be familiar with Donald Miller. Does that name ring a bell? Some of you may have read Blue Like Jazz a few years back. He wrote a book called Story Brand, a brand new book that just came out called Business Made Simple. Um, He introduced a phrase, this was about three years ago, that I, I read it for the first time and I thought, okay, that's a phrase that resonates with me. And it is, if you confuse, you lose. If you confuse, you lose. Um, And so we don't want to be confused, amen? I don't want to be confused. But at the same time, I don't want to be confusing. Um, So in order to help us as a community of faith, in order to help us be on the same page, we are utilizing a framework that gives us a shared vocabulary, a shared vision, a shared focus, a shared process. And no framework is perfect because humans are always involved. And if you've noticed we're not perfect, you got that memo, right, everybody? But we do the best we can. And we hope and pray that our Lord will do the rest, right, through his mercy and through his grace. So last Sunday, I shared an introduction to the interim plan that we are asking you to to work with us as we examine phase one of the four primary phases that we're working through in the interim season. And so last Sunday, we talked a little bit about inquiry. And so during the inquiry phase, we gathered data. Um, So many of you were so kind to take the congregational survey. Again, we thank you for that. And what I'd like to do this morning is just give you a sample of what you told us. So I'm going to tell you what you told us, okay? And so here's just a few things that uh, we'll share with you, kind of a teaser to let you know what's coming up. And I think in about three weeks, we're going to share the rest of the uh, data with you. But uh, the, the gender breakdown, uh, 58% of those who took the survey were female and 41% were male. So ladies, you kind of blew it out of the water on that one, okay? So 173 women, 121 men, 294 people. Uh, took that answer that question. Now, what is your age? Okay, this kind of got my attention a little bit. 69% of the people who responded to the survey are over 40. Okay, so we have a little work to do, a little work to do to uh, reach some younger people and engage and and pull them into the uh, process. But that was a pretty big number that jumped out at me. Uh, Almost a fourth of the respondents are 70 and older, so way to represent. 70 and older crowd, good job. Uh, what's uh, racial, ethnic background? Uh, about 83% white, Caucasian, uh, 10% um, Spanish, Hispanic, Latino, um, uh, black, uh, African American, 3.4, and uh, other, uh, you can see there, Asian, 3%. So we're kind of a, kind of a melting pot of, of sorts, but predominantly uh, white, Caucasian church. Which best describes your current uh, household? You can see that breakdown there. Uh, We have several folks living by themselves. Uh, The biggest number are two or more adults with a child or with children, about 41%. So that's a pretty big big block, right? Um, uh, What describes your marital status? Uh, 70% of those who responded are married. 
And you can see some other breakdowns there uh, related to the data. So thank you for that uh, feedback. Uh, how many of you uh, have minor children that are currently living in your household? Um, five um, or more children, uh, there are 11 of you that have five. Bless you. Bless your heart. Um, so we're just going to, we're going to pray mightily for uh, those folks. The biggest majority uh, have, have none, no children live in home. But since most of us, you know, are uh, a little bit older, right, that kind of makes sense. A lot of, lot of empty nesters in the group. Uh, what's your highest level of formal education? The, the bulk of us have some college or a bachelor's degree. About 40 people have a master's degree. Uh, and nine have a terminal degree, so that's, you know, that's impressive um, as a fairly educated church. Uh, what's your employment status? Um, 28% of you are retired, and 9% uh, of you are employed part-time. So 84 plus 27, um, we, we have well over 100 people who are working part-time or who are retired, so that's great. It doesn't mean you don't have anything to do, but it means there's some good opportunity for us to rethink mission and ministry and, and how we can get more hands even involved in the work. And a lot of you have uh, got a lot of responsibility with your jobs as well. So there's some additional things that you shared. 68% of your earning families, uh, those who responded, make less than $100,000 a year. 78% of you have lived in the Phoenix area for 10 years or more. 78% of you were raised in a Christian home. That's just ironic, by the way. One doesn't really have anything to do with the other. 68.5% um, of you grew up in a church of Christ. So 68 out of 100 of us grew up in churches of Christ. 36% uh, of you have been a Christian for more than 40 years. Wow, that's a long time. 69% of you were baptized before you turned 18. Think about that, 69%. Can I get a shout out to Joel this morning? Keep up the good work, brother. Keep up the good work. It's so important that as we're ministering to our young men and women, uh, this statistic tells us, I think, how important that is. Who played a key role in leading you to Christ? Man, aren't we grateful for our moms? 53% said that mom had a big impact. And 42% said that dad did. And uh, other folks, as you can see, sprinkled throughout the data there. Uh, one more thing that was really interesting, this kind of caught my attention. We ask you the question, which of the following pose a significant struggle for you personally? You remember this, right? And we had multiple things that were listed. And thank you for your transparency. So your number one response to this question. You know what it was? Anybody want to guess? Go ahead to the next slide. It was impatience. That was what your, that was what your number one response was. I just wanted to see how you, dwelt, how you dealt with that, you know, with a little, a little silence there. So, so this is what's fascinating to me. You confess that your number one struggle is impatience. And so what does God do? God gives you a six-month process to work through, okay? You didn't even have to pray. The Spirit knew exactly what was going on. So this is a beautiful time for us to learn to work on our impatience, right? And those who wait upon the Lord, what is the promise? Will renew their strength, right? Not become weaker. So let's keep that in mind. Okay, we're going to have a lot more to say about that. Uh, Brad Curley, the elders, are going to be presenting some information to you on some of the more detailed feedback that you gave. And uh, we'll look forward to sharing that, that sharing time. I think it's going to be a very special day. Uh, I also have a lot more to say about our four stages as we work through them. But I just want you to notice, based on our sermon series, I just want you to notice um, how, how much these stages parallel a lot of the work that we see in Nehemiah. Uh, he prayed and he surveyed. That's inquiry. He recognized opportunities and he also recognized threats. That's identification. He processed with his teams, and he had a lot of conversations with people, and that's interviewing. And he welcomed people to this good work, and that's invitation. So what I want to do this morning is just dig a little bit deeper into this story in Nehemiah. In chapter 6, we see a lot of resistance. Uh, a lot of threats, 
a lot of the bad guys wanting to kind of tear down that which had been done. In chapter uh, 7, we get this incredibly lengthy list <laughs> of people and families and uh, individuals that uh, you know, came and, and took, took their spot in the, in the greater community. And really, if you think about Nehemiah, yeah, it's about building a wall, but more importantly than that, it's about re- restoring identity again to the people of God. That's really, I think, kind of one of the key elements of the story. And then we get to chapter 8, and this is about response and, and I hope that as we go into the text this morning that we're going to see not just in the story of Nehemiah, but even how these themes carry over into the New Testament and one of the desired outcomes that God has for his people. The sermon today has one primary point, one primary point. I want you to be listening for it, and uh, hopefully you'll get to the aha moment before I even mention it, okay? Nehemiah 8, verse 1. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people came together as one. They came together in the square before the water gate, and they told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So just keep looking at that verse for a few moments. The the precedent for these types of gatherings was established many years prior. We have to go all the way back to Leviticus uh, chapter 23, verse 24, when God instructs Moses to observe the feast of the trumpets. Uh, Rosh Hashanah, I think is what it's called today. Uh, On the first day of the seventh month, and it's really important to notice something here. Uh, the, the people gathered together at the water gate, not the people were called together to gather at the water gate. They, they just assembled there. They came there together. And I want you to hang on to that thought for just a second because we're going to come back to it. Verse 2. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. And so this is not a temple gathering. Because if it was a temple gathering, only the men would have been allowed. This is a congregational gathering. This is men and women and children who are old enough to understand what's going on. And I think this too is really important. Because parents in this situation are openly modeling their faith to their children. According to Leviticus 23, this is a holy day. A holy day when all are called together. A day when even work is put aside. So that everybody can focus on the word of God. It's also a day of celebration. And I'm, I'm intrigued that reading from God's word and celebration are so closely tied together. Is it any wonder that much later when Jesus comes, his message is going to be a message that's called good news, right? It's good news. Ezra read aloud from daybreak. Till noon. As he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men and women and others who could understand, and all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra read excerpts from Genesis through Deuteronomy for six hours, and the people listened attentively. This is a preacher's dream church. I mean, can you imagine the feedback? Uh, Greg, you only preached 30 minutes. What about the other five and a half hours we were expecting today? I mean, like, yeah, I'm, sure to, I'm, pretty, I'm pretty sure the Hebrew word is like, yeah, right. I mean, that's not it, right? That's not it. So we see how the people respond. And here's the thing. It gets even better. Ezra, the teacher of the law, stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Ezra opened the book. All the people could see him because he was standing above them. And as he opened it, oh, get this. As he opened the book, the people all stood up. For how long? 
Six hours at least. So think back to what we discovered in verse 1. The people gathered at the water gate, not the people were called to the water gate. Ezra didn't say, hey everybody, I'm going to be reading from the law for six hours. The people asked him to read from the law. The people came to the preacher and said, speak to us, Ezra. Not the preacher going to the people and begging them to come listen to the word of God. You see the difference? In verse 4, we can infer that the people built the wooden platform for the reading of the law. Not they were told to build the wooden platform. The people are hungry for the word of God. Ezra here, he's not imposing some kind of law on the people. He's not instructing them on how to set things up. And why is this important? Because I think it helps us understand that when people experience an identity transformation, something happens in their heads and something happens in their hearts. And in this case, those who formerly listened to their own words, do you remember? Oh, those guys are out to get us. Oh, this is awful. Oh, the sky is falling. They started listening to their own negative rhetoric and now they are eager to listen to the word of the Lord. Verse 1. Those who had lost their focus, they were paying attention to all of the threats around them. Now they are paying attention to the word, verse 3 and verse 7. But that's not all that's going on. I want you to notice how the story continues to unfold. Nehemiah 8, verse 6, Ezra praised the Lord, the great God. And all the people lifted their hands and they responded, Amen, Amen. And then they bowed down and they worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground. So those whose hands were formerly lifted in surrender to the enemy are now lifted in praise to the Lord. After this six-hour encounter with the Word of God. Ezra and Nehemiah were men who were called by God to lead the people of God. As in every healthy congregation of God's people. There comes a time when the people of God embrace their leadership and they live in covenant community with one another. And that's exactly what happens here. So if the scribe who recorded the people's eagerness and their attentiveness and worshipfulness if the scribe who recorded those things, if he was recording our worship assemblies today, how's he going to describe our history to future generations? Would he talk about our eagerness? Would he talk about our joy? Would he talk about our initiative? Not preacher to church, but church to preacher or church to leader? I think, I think these are questions that are worth wrestling with. Because I think when we move ahead just a little bit, we see continue. I'm amazed at how the people respond here to the word of God. Verse 9 tells us, Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest and teacher of the law, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Can you? Isn't that just one of the most beautiful phrases you've ever read in your life? Why do we weep? Why do we cry? Isn't it sometimes when we're just convicted in our hearts? Maybe these were in part tears of joy, but I think also there were some tears of sadness here as they were repenting, as they were convicted of what They've been focusing on those things around them versus focusing on the Lord. And so Ezra and Nehemiah and the, and the Levites, they, they say, let's, let's stop the tears. Let's cry a different kind of tear. Reading God's word helps us become aware of our sin, but, but it's, it's awareness that leads to tears of repentance, and that ultimately opens the, the door to joy, Correct? 
So remember, this was set up as a joyous gathering, a festival of trumpets, a time to celebrate the new year. But the people of God, they're so overcome by what they've been freed from, they're so convicted by what happens when God's people work together, they're so humbled by the understanding of the renewed covenant to the law of God and to one another that the tears just flow openly and freely. Nehemiah says, go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some of those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. Do not grieve for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah, he's moved by their response. And the man who helped them pick up the pieces of a broken wall now leads them in celebration as God restores their broken hearts. And that brings us kind of full circle today. Because remember, these are a people whose hearts and whose lives have been restored. We talked about this earlier. They are no longer in disgrace. Now they are in God's grace. They are a people. Their identity has been transformed. And that's what God did through Nehemiah and through Ezra and the community of faith who realized that rebuilding the walls around Jerusalem is about a whole lot more than just brick and mortar. And may we realize the same as we move from inquiry to identification, to interview, and to invitation so that, so that we as a church can help people move, uh, particularly in our community, from move from, from loneliness to connectedness, from isolation to belonging, and from looking for a community to being in community. And it will not be easy. We've looked at this in previous chapters, and we all know what's happening all over the world right now. There are going to be those within, and there will be those from without who will attempt to derail our mission. That's just the human condition. It's, it's, it's just part of being a family. But we have to remember the words of Nehemiah in chapter 8 and verse 10. While we, while we are under a new covenant, this part of the former covenant is just as viable as the day that it was spoken for the first time. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And I think that's true for us as individuals, but, but it's also true for us as a church If I could just make one slight adjustment as we think about what this means for us as a body of believers, I think it would be safe for us to say the joy of the Lord is our strength. And it's not just an Old Testament book of Nehemiah theme. You know that, right? Joy is pervasive throughout all of Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament. I want you to see this from Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority. Now, there's some confusion here. We're not exactly sure to which leaders the Hebrew writer is referring. Could be church leaders, could be community leaders. We're not 100% sure. Uh, Scholars are kind of debating uh, what the writer actually means here. But it kind of doesn't matter (laughs) because Scripture shows us precedent for both, right? So have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be of no benefit to you. Are your elders telling you, I can't begin to tell you how much joy it brings to my heart to be an elder of this church? Do you hear that from your elders? I hope so. I hope so. Do they look joyful? Do you see them smiling? encouraging, engaging. Boy, I hope so. I hope so. Because if our elders aren't full of joy, the problem may not be with the elders. Can I get an amen? It's possible. It's possible. It's worth thinking about examining our own hearts, examining our own heads, examining our own motives. 
Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, and say it with me, joy. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Some of us say, well, yeah, I'm really joyful. Okay, that's called incongruent, okay? Your heart forgot to inform your face that you're joyful. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It it means part of what, what, what flows up out of us as followers of Jesus Christ, along with the other fruit that we mentioned in one of our very first sermons that we preached here. In Acts chapter 13, in verse 52, the disciples were filled with, say it with me, joy and with the Holy Spirit. Isn't that fascinating? How that joy and Holy Spirit power seem to work in tandem. Romans chapter 15 and verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all, say it with me one more time, joy and peace as you trust in him. So that you may overflow with the hope by power of the Holy Spirit. Philippians chapter 1 verses 25 and 26. Convinced of this. Paul writes, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. So my brothers and sisters at the Mesa Church of Christ, if people said any one thing about your church would not one of the highest compliments that you could ever receive be now that's a church that's filled with the joy of the Lord wouldn't that be awesome what do you know about the Mesa Church of Christ well I don't know a lot about it but boy I know one thing that's a church that's filled with the joy of the Lord that's a compliment I could get behind Compliment I can get pretty excited about. And we know that it's much more than just about being joyful, right? We know the source of that joy. We know the driver of that joy. We know what it is to look forward to what God is doing and what God will do, even as we reflect on what God has done, right? I can't make you be filled with joy. How many of you as parents actually said to your children, stop crying or I will give you something to cry about, okay? Now, that's a phrase that's pretty familiar to us. How effective was that? All we just taught our kids to do was stuff their emotions, right? I can't teach you how to just be a joyful people. I can model joy for you. I can hope that you embrace it. We can see how many times in Scripture joy is given again and again and again. So I can't make you embrace that, but I can invite you to the joy party. It's what God does again and again and again. And I hope that as we work the plan that you will joyfully accept the invitation to participate. One point to the sermon today. You know what it is? Anybody want to guess? The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. In a time when so many people are looking in so many different places and in so many different spaces and lifting to so many different voices to try to find their identity or who they are or what life's all about or what's going to make them happy, on and on and on the list goes. What is the one promise that we know we can have confidence in and put our full trust in? What is the one promise? The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of our Lord is our strength. And so I want to encourage you this week. Here's your challenge. Here's your challenge as a church, individually and collectively. Look for opportunities to praise the Lord for joy. Look for times to be joyful. Try to identify those things that you can give God praise over. Try to find things that people are doing right. Try to find things that people are doing right and say, thank you, and say, that's awesome. Say, wow, I really see what God is doing in your life. Because if we constantly walk around just trying to find things that people are doing wrong, i got to tell you, it's not going to be a very joyful life. Can I get an oh, yeah? It's not a very joyful life. But the flip side, when we see what Christ has done, when we believe it and embrace it and go out and are willing to share it with others, that, that gives life meaning, that gives life purpose, 
It gives us a reason to continue keeping on. So, maybe a long time since you heard a sermon with one point, but there it is, okay? The joy of the Lord is our strength, and your challenge this week is to go out and identify some ways to live that out. We're going to share a song together this morning and uh, talk about a joyful celebration. If you want to be baptized today, have your sins washed away, what an amazing experience that would be to share that with you, to pray with you, to rejoice with you, knowing that there are angels in heaven who are rejoicing. Uh, for the one who would give their life to Christ Jesus. Perhaps you need prayers of the church this morning uh, for, for multiple reasons. It could be for sickness. It could be for encouragement. It could be for forgiveness. I don't really know what's on your hearts. But uh, one of our traditions is to sing a song of invitation together. And during that, during that song, uh, shepherds are down here at the front to pray with you, to have conversation with you. You can make your way down here. If you're not uh, comfortable walking down in front of people, when we wrap up this morning, I'll be back in the foyer when our time is over and be happy to have a conversation back there with you as well. Church, let's stand together. Let's sing together.